Constructing your life is about much more than just building a bank account. Each week, join real estate entrepreneur and mindset coach Austin Linney as he interviews guests who are constructing their dream lives and impacting the world around them on a daily basis. If you're an entrepreneur or wanting to start a business, or you just want to hear motivating stories of how others have overcome the odds, you are in the right place. And now for your host, Austin Linney. Guys, welcome back to Construct Your Life. Uh, I'm so excited. Uh, I'm going to go take a nap after this conversation. I know that already because uh, it's going to be a heady conversation. But we have Russell uh, Kors and Corey, a man from The Uplift, uh, who you might have heard a couple of times. Russell, if you could give a quick you know, five to seven minute intro of who you are and what you do, and we'll just jump in here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've been in crypto since about 2014. Uh, and in 2017, um, I started my own company in response to the bull run that was taking place that year when Bitcoin was $1,000 in January and 20000 by December. Um, and that entire year, uh, every day I was getting frantic phone calls from friends, associates, acquaintances, anybody that knew that I was involved in the space. And the conversation was, the, every conversation was the same. It was essentially please help me. I'm desperate to buy. I've been trying to figure this out. I've been trying to register an account on an exchange and it's impossible to get fiat in and I don't know how to do it. And the KYC is confusing me because the user experience was horrible. I mean, it's a little bit better today. It's still not great, but it's, but five years ago, it was really, really bad. And so uh, the idea that I had was uh, an ecosystem, a blockchain based uh, portal that is designed for brand new users with no experience. Uh, the idea was to make things as easy as possible, as intuitive as possible. Uh, and, the, and we named our company EV365 for that reason. Uh, in 2018, we launched uh, Easy Exchange, which was one of the first exchanges in the world with credit card processing and telephone support, uh, because those were two things that were sorely lacking in the exchange industry at the time. Uh, we've since taken down that exchange. We're relaunching it as an institutional trading desk, but that was our first product. Uh, we also have uh, a gaming platform called Easy Win that we're developing, uh, provably fair blockchain-based gaming, and uh, a learning portal called Easy Academy. And then the, the division that we launched about uh, two years ago, uh, which has been most of the focus in terms of business development, has, is called Easy NFT. And uh, I personally got into NFTs in a big way sort of towards the end of 2019. Uh, I, I saw the opportunity that this is kind of the next big thing in, in the blockchain space. Uh, and so we dedicated most of our resources. And for us, you know, the, the idea is to um, work with anybody that has an innovative and creative idea around NFTs, uh, but maybe don't have the uh, technical resources or the expertise to launch. Uh, so they partner with us and we have all of those pieces in place. And, you know, the focus really for us right now is uh, to try to get NFTs to that next level of, of mass adoption. And, you know, I love art. I love collectibles. I love metaverse. Uh, I'm heavily invested in all three. And, and, and these are the three portals that kind of got us to where we are today. And without that, NFTs would have never gone, uh, gotten here. But to get to that next level... I think we need to disrupt traditional industries and, um, and and really show how this NFT technology could, uh, could 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 transform lives in the real world today. And I mean, that's really the focus. Is is <clears throat> for us NFTs are not you know we don't when we market a project we don't we don't we don't lead with NFTs. Maybe a year ago that was a good strategy, but today. That's no longer the case. And so today, you know, the, the investors, collectors have become a lot more discerning. They do their due diligence and they want to understand how does this provide value in the real world? What are the ongoing long-term benefits and utilities to this NFT? And so <clears throat> we look at NFTs as a means to an end. Uh, we, we use these technologies because they allow us to do things that are impossible with legacy technologies and they allow us to accomplish our goals better than any other tech out there. And so it becomes a means to an end and it becomes a delivery system for these amazing real world benefits. But we, we you know, that's the focus of the NFTs. This is now a technology, an amazing technology. We, we, we take advantage of the immutability and transparency, but ultimately we're delivering value in the real world 
using these technologies. So that's where we are today. And, and what leads to our conversation is that we're, we, we recently announced uh, an amazing project in the mortgage space. This is one good example of sort of the disruption of traditional industries. Um, and we can get into this a lot, a little bit more, but uh, that's, that's a very exciting project for me. I love that. And, and Corey, you know, in the uplift and you and I probably have weekly conversations about kind of how to bring this into the space and, and we'll dive into the mortgage space. You know, as you see it, you've been in the space for quite a while. What do you think the common uh, looker in on the sector is not paying attention to? Like, what are what are they not seeing? Is it is they looking at it as a picture? They're not seeing the actual utility behind what it means, right? Yeah, that it's it's a singular programmable, uh, uh, unique thing, right? It's an ownable digital thing in a way that people kind of gloss over. Um, and you know what Russell's looking at. And by the way, like just for anybody you know who doesn't know Russell, the guy freaking walks on water. As far as I'm concerned. Um, one of my favorite human beings on the face of the earth and barely scratched the surface of what he's into. Uh, we've had long conversations. He actually <clears throat> um, brought me to uh, a, a, a symposium on artificial intelligence um, with uh, some uh, 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 singularity net uh, people. And it was just, that's a whole other long conversation. <laughs> but just, I, yeah. I, I, I couldn't let this moment go without, you know, uh, blowing Russell up a little bit. It's, it's fantastic. Thank but I think you. like what what Russell's working on is a really good example of this. And the crazy thing is that it's just an example, right? Yeah. The entire deed industry is going to go to the blockchain and it's going to be with NFTs yeah. because yeah. obviously it will. When you understand like, you know, mutable data on an NFT and the fact that, you know, the, 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 the blockchain is, is persistent and transparent, um, you know, it, it just especially with the deed you know, industry you know, the, the, the title industry in the States is mental, right? There's all sorts yeah. of different regions, you know, they've like, they're <laughs> using paper in basements half the time, yeah. right? Like it's, it's, yeah. it's really just stupid, right? It's like, it's the horse and carriage right now. And it's, it's going to get disrupted. Like this is absolutely where all this stuff is going to go. Um, and, and that's just one industry, right? So if you can point to, uh, you know, anything we're having a unique identifier, um, you know, uh, where it's a house or a car or a health record, or, I mean, <clears throat> one of the things we're working on with the uplift is we're going to be integrating, uh, um, uh, you know, artificial agents. Actually, Russell, we've actually started piecing together all that stuff. It's hard. I don't know. Like we're, that ball's moving forward faster than I thought, but we're going to have an NFT where you're going to own uh, an artificial intelligent buddy, right? So the user experience of that is like, you're just going to buy this NFT. You're going to own it. Where it's going to get interesting is that <coughs> excuse me, in the mutable data to that NFT, it will be linked to a repository of how that AI, that language engine element has been trained over time, right? Mm -hmm. So it's going to create its own personality kind of, right? Yeah. And you know, like there's at a certain date, it just will be its personality. Uh, but those, those two things will be inextricably linked. Or deeds in the metaverse is kind of the no-brainer thing that yeah. that you know the uplift has been doing since the beginning, right? Which really is just the precursor to deeds in the real world, as far as I'm concerned, right? But it it should show people where it's at. Like the 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 idea that you could do art this way is adorable, right? You're gonna be able to and and has you know it's got a market cap that's not small even right now, right? Like people can gloss over it because you know the number went up really high and then the number comes down a little bit. Like everybody who's been in crypto is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like so what, right? <laughs> You know, come come talk to us in four years if you want to yeah. complain about it right now, right? Mm -hmm. And this is really you can always tell the difference between you know the the sort of retail you know investors. I don't want to use the phrase dumb money, but uh, right, the people that are around in the bear market, you can tell they're all like, yeah, you, you buy when it's low. Well, it's low, <laughs> right? It's not. So, but the sentiment like. <laughs> and, and so something I want to share because everybody's heads are spinning who listens to my podcast. I'm going to always bring it back to so y'all can understand. I, I think, Russell, where I want to go with this is the easiest kind of sign where you started seeing the change in the real estate sector, which I thought was dumb as hell and, and COVID ha ha to happen, was we started doing closings of properties on Zoom. Right. And you started and, and now my friends are traveling to Spain and Europe and, and and they're getting mobile notaries and they're in California and they're closing on properties like 
the fact that it took COVID to bring in, you know, Zoom closings blows me away, right? That you had to fly across the country to sign in person at some title company, right? I, I know that's a small thing on a big scale in what you're working on, but that's kind of where I'm trying to get people to understand is like, that was the, let's just say, I think when innovation comes in, the door creaks open just a little bit. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, somebody that I really respect, who's a high, high level investor said, you got to understand everything that came in with COVID was already on its track. It just came 10 years earlier. Mm-hmm. And, and so is that, you know, like, let's be honest, the title people that have been in this legacy, as you called it, which was an amazing uh, display, they're not going to give it up easy. Uh, you know, and I think on a, on a larger scale, you know, there is conversation where banks are going to be obsolete too, right? Mm-hmm. And so these are the conversations that institutions and legacy businesses are going to, they're going to put up a fight. And and mainly, and I, heard, I, hate, I hate to crack open like three different layers here, but mainly they're probably trying to buy themselves enough time where they can get into the business also, right? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, it is, you know, the banks now understand that Bitcoin and crypto is an existential threat because ultimately all a bank is is a financial intermediary. They, they exist to, to confirm transactions between two parties because people can't trust each other. And now with with crypto, uh, you have peer-to-peer trustless transactions and you don't need the bank anymore. And so uh, as DeFi expands and as this whole space grows, you're going to see more and more services. We're already, and we'll get into this in a minute, but, you know, I'm looking for and I I have found DeFi protocols that can finance you insurance and, and mortgages and basically all of the financial products that you would get at a bank in a real estate transaction you can now get directly peer to peer. And so um, it, it, they'll continue fighting it, but uh, you know, it's a lost cause as we know, it, it, you know, the, the music industry fought Napster and it never worked. And the, the best thing you can do is, is adapt and embrace, but um, I just don't see banks being able to do that. So <laughs> it'll be interesting. So let's break down one simple thing, right? If you can, in the simplest way, you can explain, you know, if you don't know how a deed works or, or why you need it, you know, I'm not going to waste, time on the podcast, explain that, Google it or YouTube it, but explain to me how blockchain shifts the narrative when it comes to a smart contract or, or an NFT contract for a property, which we're seeing hit the market. Well, the one thing that is most significant is that uh, if, you, uh, if you put all land ownership on the blockchain, in other words, make all land ownership trustless, then you... You, you make a profound change in, in, a, in a big part of the world. So in North America and Western Europe and elsewhere, the process we're creating will, will mean a more secure, more privacy focused and more efficient process. All great things, but admittedly not life changing. But in many parts of the world where there's a lot of fraud and corruption or where everything is kept on paper records, this difference is, is massive because now you know, you have, the the problem is, is, you know, you think about even forget fraud and corruption for a minute, but a a government office that keeps everything on paper gets flooded and all the paperwork gets destroyed. And then good luck proving you own the land you live on. I mean, you you, you have no way of of, of ensuring that. So now all of a sudden when we have it in, in a you know, obviously the the uh, the army can show up at your front door with guns, and you know they're, you're going to vacate the premises. But ultimately, uh, there's at least a record of who the rightful owner is. There's a dispute process. I mean, there's there's you know there's recourse, and and um, and I think for me that's obviously we're going to be starting you know at the low hanging fruit in Canada, the U.S., and and will expand. But but what I'm most excited about is going even it's not even we're not even talking third world. Malta, which is known as Blockchain Island, keeps all real estate records on paper. I have a good friend there. He tried to buy a house. He said it took three months just to get just to get the the uh, borders and and the and the, the land registry and and you know to to get the the actual uh, land verified. And that's crazy in 2022 that that's still the case in a in a, in a majority of the world. So. Um, I see a massive opportunity and and for us, you know, we're building uh, a process 
Uh, and then once we have it, we are, so I, we partnered, I partnered with the largest uh, private lender in Canada and uh, uh, Matrix Mortgage Global, uh, the broker of records named Sean Allen, a really, really bright guy. He's a five-time broker of the year winner uh, here in Canada. And he has very deep ties to the industry and to the regulators. And so once we build a system that works and is tested and, and you know, he has 130 uh, agents that we can, we have, our, you know, a built-in sort of uh, beta testing scenario uh, with real clients. But ultimately, once it's all working, once we're happy with it, we go to the industry and we say, you know, here's how you do things today. Here's the way we do them. Here are all the advantages to our system. This should become the new industry standard. And, and so that's the last piece of this puzzle once we built everything. I'm, I'm confident that they will see the logic in that and, and uh, you know, they, they will be open, especially this is, we're probably talking, you know, 12 to 18 months out because there's a lot of development that has to happen first. But uh, I think the industry will be ready. I think the, the, the blockchain space will have matured a little bit. And in the meantime, we are doing a ton of outreach and education. We're doing podcasts as well to, to really um, educate the real estate sector on all of the advantages of blockchain. And, and I think, you know, as we build out our multiple businesses that we're buying and we're looking at the problems of the of the sector and, and all that stuff, it really all circles back to education always. Right. And always. you know what? You know what Americans hate? Mainly Americans. They don't like to be surprised. <laughs> they don't like to be surprised. Uh, hosting, you know, multiple thousands of Airbnb guests. That's the number one thing. They don't like to be surprised. But when mm -hmm. you educate them up front. And, you know, their neighbor down the street says, you know, man, I did it this way and it was super easy. Right. Um, you know, we're buying um, uh, a business right now. You know, the whole process is going to take north of six months. Easy. Right. Due diligence. Uh, the current business is on paper. You know, he's never used, you know, technology. We got to do due diligence. Then we got to go raise money. It, it, you know, I, I look at uh, business transaction in the future. You know, all your information is on the blockchain secured. And, you know, the money's in an account that you just transfer over. It's already sitting there. You know, I could see these business transactions or real estate deals happening in, in, in five to seven days, you know, uh, verified. And, and, and so where I tell everybody is if you really want to make hay, right, when we're moving into these new sectors is you don't have to be essentially the person, you know, innovating the stuff, but you can be the person servicing the needs of that set thing like security. Um, they're going to need to change the records from paper over to the blockchain. That's going to be a huge business, right? Mm -hmm. And and these are the aspects that people aren't paying attention to because it's all in the sizzle, right? The the, the stuff out there, right? And so, um, you know, Corey, with the market where where it's gone down over the last you know six months or two year, um, and I do believe, and I'm I'm going to throw you up a softy because I brought it up in our meeting this morning. <laughs> and I hope this rant's going to last a long time. Uh, I have been reading a bunch. Um, I don't know as much as y'all do, but basically the, the word on the street is they feel like uh, the institutions uh, found out this thing was going to be utility, Bitcoin and all this stuff. And they basically dumped the market so they could lower the prices so they could catch up and, and snag up the Bitcoin uh, because there's news of them working with the USD, you know, and all that stuff like that. You know, I know the market was it was going to go down no matter what, right? Everybody was yeah. getting absolutely crazy, but just kind of what's your overall, anybody that's listening out there that that's on NFT, blockchain, Bitcoin, where's your overall kind of temperature on the market where it sits? Yeah, the market is well in line with the cyclical Bitcoin market that happened long before uh, uh, institutions started playing around in the game. Mm -hmm. So just that you can ignore everything that says that institutions did this. Um, unless they've been doing it the entire time, which I don't think they have, right? <clears throat> the, the market cap for all of crypto is still in line such that JP Morgan could, could make it go wherever it wants and it hasn't been doing it. Now, that said, it's, it's not like institutions don't have a lot more exposure to it now. They do, and that's going to increase. Um, and it's not like they're not trying to uh, come up with, uh, with government-based stable coins because they totally are. And you know, they're, they're going to plan on, on uh, um, you know, dominating those. Which actually I think would be a value add because that's really just gonna be a pass through for all of us doing interesting things, you know, in the the wild west of of crypto. 
you know, having a, a, a stable on off ramps is, is, is potentially going to be really good. I think to foster innovation, like they might actually end up doing good things. Granted, you know, make sure you pay your taxes because all that stuff's going to be tracked. Granted, most of the stuff mm -hmm. is tracked uh, perpetually anyway. Um, so yeah, the, that, I'm, I'm leery of people trying to describe, you know, the large powers that be kind of having that effect. They're definitely moving into the space. We know this, right? Um, but it's still tracking in line with Bitcoin. What's really interesting to me is what I'm looking out for for this cycle, right? Because to be 18 months from now, we're, we're in a, a, another strong bull market mm -hmm. that's, Absolutely. you know, we're, pl mm -hmm. we're planning for that, right? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> things that I think could make it come sooner. Um, you know, the NFT market doesn't always care about the price of Bitcoin. There was actually multiple mini bull markets in NFTs uh, before the, the latest top, right? So, you know, at the uplift, we're, uh, you know, sort of, uh, preparing to well create them, frankly, but like we're not going to wait around and and, and 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 hope for them. So that's a possibility. The Ethereum merge, like there will come a day where Bitcoin isn't running the entire crypto market. That's yep. going to happen. Mm -hmm. Bitcoin is is an amazing brand as a technology. It's not even that interesting anymore. It's really not right. So you know, does Ethereum now take that mantle now that they've got a proof of stake? That could upend. The cyclical nature of it and put us into a super cycle you know that that doesn't stop right like, you know that that could be something that, that that sort of affects it right and you know you have to sort of count that as a as a, a, a rare potential you know uh, situation and always assume you know caveat there's always you know risk nothing's going to go up for every yada, yada yada right but it's right now it's just steady she goes bitcoin cycle and sort of what we're planning on mm -hmm. um, with the highest degree of certainty I love that. And, and Russell, you know, my job is to read people. That's what I do for a living. It's kind of my special skill. I've been on, you know, a thousand podcasts, hosted a bunch. And I look at somebody like you and, and my big cry in the investment community is like, you're as much as you might be extremely successful and you're going to make even more money if everything you prove out, you know, comes to fruition. I can truly see your passion for, for what you do being on the cutting edge. And I guess, could you explain to me why more people, you know, I feel like especially when something's new and shiny, they want to come in and they want, and, and then as soon as the market shifts, they're, they're bitching and moaning, like they're not an investor, right? Like, uh, you know, uh, my friend said yesterday, he's an apartment investor. Every investment was the best investment you ever made if it was on the proper time horizon. Yeah. <laughs> so can you talk to that? I mean, you've been in the space for a while, you know, where does that mindset come from, and 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 is that just because you put yourself in rooms in the right situations that 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 you get fulfillment from? I mean, to a certain extent, yes. And and um, it's funny. I, I I just as as uh, Corey was talking, I thought of another uh, a euphemism for dumb money. Let's say people who are experiencing their first crypto winter. <laughs> that's that's so people. Yeah. That's, <laughs> and I was dumb money. So I think that's it. Yes, that's well, exactly. 100%. It's your first every, winner for sure. I, I will say this. Everybody uh, that's 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 in crypto and experiencing their first bull run and crypto winter is dumb money. And it's not an indictment on the person holding it. My money was extremely dumb my first cycle. I mean, because I had no idea what I, everybody was dumb their first cycle, right? So uh, when you once you start understanding and, and you see the patterns um, you know, and, and it's a lot of it is just human psychology. The people that uh, that are in their first cycle when Bitcoin was sixty eight thousand, they were like, "Oh, if only I could have bought Bitcoin when it was twenty thousand. And as soon as it hits twenty thousand, they're like, "Oh, it's on its way down. I'm no longer interested." And then as soon as it goes back up again, when it hits sixty, they'll be interested again. So it's it's just hard to win. But uh, once you once you see and recognize the patterns, it's a lot easier on your second cycle to sort of. Uh, make up for all your mistakes the first time around. So I think a, a lot of it is that. And, you know, the, the the cycles are not guaranteed. Of course, they're not written in stone. But I think, and, you know, anytime there's a massive run-up, you, you need to blow off some steam. It needs to, you know, it's a natural correction. It's healthy as well because, you know, right now this is uh, every cycle, it, it gets filled with opportunists and projects that have no real value and are just looking to make a quick buck. And then the crypto winter shakes them all out and they all go away. And only the real projects with real sustainable value stick around for the next cycle. So it, it's 
you know, and it, as I like to say, um, I, I winterized my portfolio, you know, last year when, it, when, when the markets were high. Um, and so if you, if you prepare a little bit, you put a little foresight in, uh, you have some trading strategies, you can definitely manage these cycles. And, and again, in the, in the long term, uh, this is, you know, we, we, we couldn't ask for a better time to accumulate. And, and I tell everybody, dollar cost averaging is your friend. And it's the best strategy. I mean, I, I personally think the market's going to go lower, but who knows? I could be wrong. And if it turns up and doesn't and doesn't look back, you're going to want to be in there and you're going to be want to be buying when, when the prices are this low. So love that. So, so you know, anybody that's listening to my show right now and they're in the mortgage business or they're in the banking business, you know, they're they're probably freaking out right now, right? And I know we're not that close, right? But 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 kind of you know, unpack. The technology and and how much if they do come on board, whether it be you know two years from now or five years, you know talk about how easier you know this this process is going to be and the utility of, of kind of this technology that you're creating. Sure. Um, okay, I'll give a brief overview, and, and we're we're doing this in stages. So the first stage is the documentation. Um, when when a client opens up a file with a mortgage broker. Uh, they they have to send a whole bunch of personal sensitive documents, their pay stubs, their property tax records, all this stuff that that they don't want falling into you know for anybody seen. Um, and the other issue, which I wasn't aware of, but partnering with a mortgage broker, I found out pretty quickly that fraud is a big problem in the industry. And people, when they send in these documents, uh, they want to get a favorable rate, they want to qualify, so they they oftentimes will will change some of the information in these documents. So when the mortgage broker receives these documents, the first thing they do, and they're received via email, and then the first thing they do is they have to authenticate. They have to verify that the information is accurate. Once they've done that, uh, these documents then get sent to uh, various other stakeholders, lawyers, lenders, appraisers, et cetera. And all of this is done via email and securely. Uh, every additional stakeholder typically will verify the authenticity of the documents all over again because anything could have happened in transit. Uh, so, and they are liable. So the first stage is using NFTs for all of these documents. So the idea is that we build a very simple uh, browser-based minting process, similar to like a Google form that a mortgage broker does not need to know anything about crypto. They just fill out all the client information. They scan the document in once they've verified it. Uh, and then they upload the image, and at the end of it, there's a little mint button. They click it. It creates an NFT, and it it, it creates that NFT at a unique URL that's you know 30 random characters long, so nobody can guess it. Um, and then when they need to send out th this document to other stakeholders, they just need to send out that URL, and anybody else can click on it and bring up the the document that they can uh, guarantee is authentic because the the data is immutable. So. That's basically stage one. Um, stage two is then taking all of the legal and rolling it into the smart contract. And of course, there's always going to be complex legal uh, real estate transactions that require a custom contract and require a lawyer to work on it. But when a, when a developer sells a subdivision of 200 homes, they're using the same contract for every single sale. And so there's a lot, I would say a majority of real estate transactions can be uh, sort of pre-reviewed. You know, you can still have uh, the, the contract reviewed by your lawyer. Um, and then once it's agreed upon, it's there. Uh, and so that's stage two is try to get the lawyers out of the equation. Stage three then is the financing component and using DeFi for mortgage and insurance and, and anything else that you need financially. And again, you know, my 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 partner is a mortgage broker. Um, the very first podcast that we did uh, was to 300 other mortgage brokers across the country. And one of them asked the question, uh, when I explained this process, he said, doesn't this get rid of the mortgage broker industry, like, isn't this going to just like? And he asked my partner, "Isn't this going to destroy your business?" <laughs> and my partner said, "Listen, it it, it it may, but don't you want to be ahead of the curve? Don't you want to be aware and informed of where your industry is going? I mean, if you were a, a fax machine salesman or a pager salesman, you wanted to know what was coming next, so you could prepare and not be left out in the cold, scrambling trying to catch up. So the idea is, you know, for better or for worse." This is where the industry is going, and the best thing you can do is to stay on top of it. So 
Um, so that, that the stage three is, is the financing. And then again, stage four, once we have all three pieces in place, stage four is we go to the industry and we make sure that they recognize these transactions as legally valid. And ideally, you know, again, we want to connect. It, eventually, you want to be able to purchase a house or a property on OpenSea by buying an NFT. But right now, even if we build the entire system, there is a manual, there's a disconnect between the land registry office at, uh, at, with the government and the blockchain. Those are not connected. So somebody at some point has to manually update those records on the government and mm -hmm. validate that transaction. And again, ideally, we want that all to be automated. So we want to connect that land registry office to the blockchain so the updates happen in real time automatically. Okay. I wonder, Go ahead. sorry, uh, some questions that I have mm -hmm. thinking about. So I was starting to think like that, that's where it's going to end up, but how do you hack it so you can do it sooner? Couldn't you wrap them in a, in a, a legal construct so that the, it just sort of followed on? Like I buy the NFT, the act of buying this NFT is in this legal document connected to this title that's in this, you know, safety deposit box, blah, 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 blah right? Um, and, and if you can do that once, you can do it a million times. For sure. We, we and that, that is part of the plan. As, as an interim okay. measure, you can use an existing contract, like a, 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 a traditional legacy contract to connect right. the smart contract with the transaction. And then there, so, you know, you still need now somebody to follow through and make sure that the other end is, is, is completed. But you, it, from a legal standpoint, definitely possible. Right, so lawyers still have jobs till AI takes over. <laughs> That's the one. Well, the other thing I wanted to mention, Russell, and I think it's it's for for people that get concerned, and I know you know this already, but especially after that that AI chat, whew, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> but the the you know, if it can be disrupted, it's going to be right. And I guess what we're saying here is that the the kind of information systems that we were using before are hilariously bad. Well, mm -hmm. well, I compared, mean, we're, compared we're, to blockchain. We're setting up a fund, right? And and they're saying it's going to cost fifty thousand dollars to do contracts, but yet I have contracts that we've already paid twenty thousand for on a previous deal. Can I not just change the entities? Yeah, they were just no, fine. I can't, right? And so and so what I'm when he's describing that, what I'm thinking about is there's so many middlemen between, right. and that's where the cost gets inflated, right? I used to yeah. work. I used to work private equity. I worked hard money. The fees are out of control. And so there's a fee for this and a fee for that. And that's what everybody's sick of. They're sick of all these fees. And you're telling me it's this price, and then it shows up and it's this price. And you know what they don't talk about? They never talk about this, how expensive it is to buy and sell a home. It's so expensive. You know, the title fee, the, the real estate agent, like all these things are, and, and, and oh, man, I made a great profit on my flip. No, you didn't. You, you, you lost 40 grand. You know, we're about to sell a $1.2 million house. Like it's going to cost us almost 90 grand to sell it. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, and they're not doing anything. Like I'm the one that's going to be promoting it. Right. And so, and so, you know, and, and to your, to what that guy said in the audience, like you have an opportunity to have that conversation, but that is a fixed mindset. That is a, mm -hmm. that is a, I'm just going to let the tidal wave okay. wash over me instead of saying, Look, I don't know everything that's going on in this space, but I sure keep my ear to the ground just in case something peaks up. You know, Ryan Paneo, who's a very popular real estate investor, big YouTube channel, he said, look, this is the deal. He said, I don't know about all this stuff. He's huge in the NFT space and, and a bunch of other things. And he has a t uh, bookkeeping company and all these different things. He said, look, I have my regular businesses that make me the cash I need. He goes, I take 10 to 20% out of all those businesses and I put it in this next, you know, blockchain and NFTs. And he goes, that's my moonshot. And so if I hit, it's great. He's like, but I'm not going to be out of the game just because I'm scared of the game. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and now he's doing events with all the people that are invested in his tykes and, and they get first dibs and things. So there's so many things um, mm -hmm. that we're just dismissing. Right. Oh, it's just the crazies, you know, that are doing that. But here's the problem. And this is why you, <laughs> you can't live off of that statement. Most of the guys I meet in this space are the older guys. It's not the 21 year olds that are like, you know, singing some song, you know, it's, it's guys that are highly intelligent. I, everybody I meet in the space is, is probably done something other in their career at a very high level. And they're saying, no, guys, this is 
this is the thing and, and you need to at least have a baseline knowledge to understand. Now, here's where it gets interesting. My uh, fiance is extremely spiritual, like very spiritual. It's kind of how she lives her life. And she's telling me that all the people that she follows and respects, these are spiritual people that probably don't wear shirts, you know, that, that kind of crowd. They're the ones saying that we need to be paying attention to DeFi because, you know, this is where the money's going. We're going to get off of the American, you know, they're saying it, right? Because people are, you know, I, I don't want, that's a whole other conversation. But, <laughs> but what I'm saying is like, there's enough signs, right? This is when I started digging into it. There's enough smart people that I know that are in this space that you and you at least need to have a baseline knowledge of what we're doing. It doesn't mean you got to dive in. It is that kind of your kind of, at least you like your cry to people when you educate them, you at least need to know something. So I, I got into, um, I started my career in 1995, uh, just as the internet was starting to take off. Uh, Windows 95 had just come out, the first uh, mouse, you know, graphical user interface uh, operating system. The first Netscape Navigator had just come out. Uh, and so I watched the internet, you know, go from something that nobody had heard of to transforming the world. And, you know, the, the, the concept of, the sooner the better uh, applied then and, and it applies now. And, and, you know, when you look at the internet, eventually everyone got on board. I mean, it, it, to, today it's it's impossible to imagine anybody unless they're very, very old. And and But anybody under the age of 70 has a, has a smartphone, uses Google, uses email. It's just, it's become completely and utterly ubiquitous. And so um, the same kind of thing I see. Uh, and the reason why I'm so passionate about blockchain is because I, I feel like there's an even greater transformative potential to this technology than existed with the internet. And I think, uh, you know, from 1985 to today, roughly 25, 27 years, uh, you know, it's the, the internet has changed everything. And, and I see blockchain and crypto and, and all this technology doing the same over the next 10, 15, 20 years. So I want to see it in the hands of as many people as possible. And, and I say this all the time that, you know, the, the sooner the better, Eventually, you're going to get on board, but the, the sooner you get there, the better off you'll be. And, and that certainly applied with the internet. The sooner you, you you understood what this technology was, the better off you were. You were able to apply it to your business, maybe investment, and you know, a lot of advantages. And the same thing occurs today. So I tell everybody, you know, it, it feels intimidating. It feels like it's overwhelming. And you may, you may think it's already too late, but the reality is we're still you know, maybe second, top of the second inning, I would say, with, with this stuff. So it's it's still such an early stage. And, um, you know, reach out. I tell everybody, reach out, uh, you know, to me uh, on Telegram. If you have questions, I'd be happy to help. I'll, I'll put you in, in touch with other people that can, that can help. And, um, you know, slowly but surely, like, enter the space because you'll you'll be here eventually, but the sooner you get here, the better off you'll be. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, interesting question right something i've been contemplating all i mean we're not obviously we're a long ways away but you know Corey, where does this leave me if like i'm somebody and i'm the, i'm not this guy but if i'm somebody and i've got like two million in cash like am i of the fear scenario where like in 10 years like I'm, that's not going to be anything like are we ever going to get there or is it just like going to be a slow transition to the digital money i I don't really ascribe too much to the stick mentality because like the, the, the sky's falling crowd have been saying exactly the same things for as long as I can remember. And the sky has yet to fall. Mm -hmm. um, right. Uh, you know, it, like inflation being what it is this year is interesting. It's going to go back down. It's no different mm -hmm. than it was in the eighties or in the seventies. Yeah, right. So this is not a magical transition. I, I, play, I play, I play golf with an older guy the other day. He was like, you young fucker, shut the fuck up. He's right. Like, oh, cause you've never <laughs> seen inflation before. Like, like, <laughs> he, said, he said, he said, can we play some golf and shut up about the damn inflation? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, like, like, the, the fear thing, like, I think dollars are still going to be around. I think inflation decade on decade is going to be relevant, right? So if you hold the cash, you're losing money anyway. You're losing buying power. You have been for 100 years. This is just, this is a known thing, right? It's why hedge funds, you know, it, it were started. Um, you know, hedging against inflation, now they're a little bit more than that. But so, so you have that. And I think, like, the, the missed opportunity cost is the thing for me. Right. Like if you really don't want to learn and you have enough, 
don't worry about it, right? Like if you if you had enough in 1995 and you were like swell off, like the internet came and went, and you're like, oh, I like golf, right? Who cares? Doesn't matter, <laughs> right? If any bit of you is hungry, then you can, you know, obviously be applying yourself to that which you know, right? You know, and 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 be growing that way. These technologies, though, are going to disrupt literally everything. So no matter what industry you're in, it really doesn't matter. Like we're talking about, you know, title, we're talking about real estate, we're talking about a few different things, but it won't matter. Like, and this is, again, a topic for another discussion. Russell and I nerded out hard with about <laughs> some, some, some people that we meet. Like it's, I see clearly as a novice, like a hardcore novice in artificial intelligence, how it will eat literally every information job that's ever existed in our lifetimes. This mm -hmm. is coming, right? Yeah. So if you're not becoming versed in it and you're hungry in any way, you're making a mistake, right? Like it, it, it's knowing how it's affecting the title industry is a great way to get into, you know, how these new information systems blockchain and, you know, and how, you know, smart contracts are going to start because it is early. And thankfully, right? Like we're still figuring out the, the, the how of it. Even like we were talking about with how much money is going into house, housing transactions. Like that's just like every sort of, you know, angel investor, every venture firm is like, you know, these are just smart contracts waiting to happen, right? It, it'll, it'll be, it'll be a trillion and trillion. Right. I mean, it'll be, the market right? cap is unexistent. Like it's literally crazy. you don't need to do anything else. Yeah, so that's every, how big it'll be. Every real estate agent is a taxi driver. Mm -hmm. right <laughs> they're just they're just waiting to get replaced and they're they'll you know it's gonna oh it's and, gonna and, be a long and time more over, it and more over because i coach I co so fast i coach a bunch this is what you get for y'all's bad attitudes this is what you get <laughs> for your front running uh, mother <laughs> efforts when the market's going good i'm not hearing much from you now right uh mm -hmm. no, no offense i love y'all out there i coach a couple but 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 uh, i love it because my guys are looking on the next step, right? And 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 so and so I actually will take a different route with it, right? My biggest issue, because I do coach people that are 40 and up, my biggest issue as adults is they've forgotten what it was like to be a kid. Mm. They they they've taken mm. the fun, the creativity out of their life. It's so damn serious. I'm gonna muscle through life. I'm gonna, I'm gonna grip the whole fucking world. I'm gonna be mad at everybody. So, so here's an opportunity for you where maybe you don't want to know about it, but maybe your son does. And maybe this is an opportunity for you to remember again what you were doing and, and go play in the uplift world or go play a, a, a game or something like that. And maybe something hits you, right? And, and so at the end of the day, like it doesn't really matter why, you know, you don't have to listen to us and you can call us crazy. I don't, I don't really care. It doesn't really matter to me. Um, but at the end of the day, technology is the the mover and the shaker that's going to push a lot of these things that, you know, if you were to, and, and I think this is this is pretty easily done because I, I do consult on a couple companies. I think if you were to take a company, you were to take 10 companies and I, I ripped apart the P&Ls, I mean, there's probably 20 to 30 percent of, of fees and costs that don't need to be in there. And so how much more streamlined, how many more jobs could we provide? How, you know, all these things, it's, everybody's looking at the bad. I'm looking at the good. Like we have an inflated and bloated corporate system of fees on fees on fees on fees on fees on fees on fees. On fees. And so um, I think this is what we're going to see is a disruption of those fees. And yeah, people are going to be upset because, you know, they're making money. But, but I think this is in the long run is going to help businesses. Well, it's, it's intellectual rent taking, right? It's like legacy systems that are like, just pay us because we were the thing that was providing trust before. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, there's way better ways to do that now. So those people are like dead companies walking. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. Because there's so much often, financial interest in replacing them. Yeah. And often your point is 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 excellent. And it's uh, you know, and that's why like it's not just been real estate, but Think of supply chain, think of all manufacturing, think of food production and distribution and how many intermediaries exist in all of those industries 
and how much more efficient they can become. And even like, you know, food production, again, we talk about like every time there's an E. coli outbreak, they have to destroy millions of pounds of cauliflower because they can't isolate where the outbreak originated from. But you've got, you know, using blockchain technology, you can scan the QR code, you know, in the grocery store and see every step along the way from farm when it was picked, where it got on a truck, every, you know, and, and it's relatively easy if you have that kind of tracking. So there's just so many applications uh, for this in the real world and in some of these traditions. Well, no, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you a for real, like in real time instance, the company we're buying, HVAC, electric, plumbing, they have no inventory system in the warehouse. The trucks need to be loaded up every morning and they have no iPad. So when they need to order a part, they write it down and then they come back like a day and a half later and then they order it, right? And so, yeah, don't get me started. So, so, so what, what people don't understand is some of my jobs, we make between 500,000 and 1.3 million every hour is, that's a lot of money. And so every time we can streamline, so I'm not saying we're going to get there yet, but our number one need is to, to put everything uh, in an inventory system, right? And, and dial it in. And, you know, it'd be great is if we got below the par on this part, like the, the AI ordered it for us, right? That we didn't even need somebody ordered it for us. And so, you know, I, now that you mentioned that, I didn't even know that there was like inventory on blockchain stuff. So now I'm super intrigued, but, 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 but what we're doing, right. And everybody thinks I'm absolutely crazy. I'm actually going to pay the techs more, the, the, the HVAC techs more, and they're going to work less. And the guys, they think I'm like the Messiah. They're like, well, tell me how this is going to work out. And I was like, well, well here's the deal. If you're if you're healthier and you're happier and you work less and you make more money, you're going to be more inclined to show up at work. There's going to be less injuries, and it's going to be great. Well, how do I do that? Well, I have to streamline the efficiencies through the through the business on the back end, and that's going to save money to be able to pay you more. And so that's what business needs to do. And uh, you know, I mean, I could tell you that they're telling me that on the supply, it's getting better. He said they're probably like four months from it being cleared up. But it was so bad during COVID that he would order a, an HVAC in March and it would show up, uh, you know, 40 months later, like, you know, mm -hmm. and he said back in the day, it was like three weeks. Right. And so and so these are the things that we're going to that that only this technology can really streamline the efficiencies of, of that. And so we need to lean into that. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. So. Russell, if people want to find out more about this education, they want to learn, they want to they want to reach out to you. How would they do that? The best way is on Telegram. Uh, it's very easy. It's at NFT King is my handle. Uh, so <laughs> uh, my name and my and my and the, what I do. But um, yeah, and, and I'm happy if anybody reaches out to say I, I I caught you on on whatever podcast and you know and and you can and I'll be happy to help and and we'll uh, you know I'll point people in the right direction. Like I my my wife told me um, last year uh, she's like you got to start charging for your time because I was. And still to this day, I would say I spend between two to five hours a week uh, just talking to people who are asking me for advice. And, uh, you know, I, I said, I, I will never charge for this time. Um, I'm happy to do it. And, and I feel like it, it helps. In the long run, it's going to come back to help me. You know, it, it gets more people uh, educated, gets more people in the industry. And, uh, you know, six months from now, when they're buying their first Bitcoin or they're doing something, they're going to think, oh, Russell, help me out there. And, send out that positive energy to the universe. And that means more to me than the $200 an hour over I could charge. So I'm happy to do it. And so anybody that wants to reach out, please do. And, and I'll do whatever I can. I love that. And so Corey, there's this really good looking guy that's been on your YouTube channel a couple of times. I mean, he is, he's slick. I think his name's Austin Linney, but I'm not sure. But how would people uh, how would people uh, go check out the YouTube channel and see what you'll have going on over at the Uplift World? Yeah, check uh, the Uplifters one word on YouTube. It'll uh, it'll pop up, or you can follow me on Twitter at Corey Cottrell, C O R E Y C O T T R E L L. Um, yeah, no, I mean that's that's you know we can we can uh, uh, pull up one of our uh, episodes and maybe throw in your show links as well if you want. Um, but yeah, thanks for having me on, and thanks for having Russell on. Like I, like I know you've been thinking about. Well, we're we're company. thinking about we're thinking about buying land and, and having a second home in Canada. So we're definitely. Oh. Going to to <laughs> well, for the, you know, I I'm in Toronto, so I live in the best city in the best country in the world, and that's just not my opinion. That's a. <laughs>
<laughs> I love it. I love it. But yeah, no. everybody else, every else in Canada. Well, well unfortunately, Russell, when I'm they're not, to, you know, unfortunately, I'm going to have to go to Calgary from because I'm from Texas. So okay, those are my enough. people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they, the, the the people in Calgary that are coaches that I know, they said Calgary might be more Texas than Texas is Texas. Yeah, yes, that's, that is true. Yeah, they said they said it's Cowboy City. So I'm like, that's oh, awesome. Okay. I'm in. And, and Corey, I'm going to be in uh, Decentral uh, Art Basel is coming up again at the end of the month. So I'll be in Miami. Hopefully, we'll. Uh, so just... we we moved. You did. Yeah, I'll, I'll pay. Yeah, we're we're uh, right. about four or five hours north of Miami now. Oh, all all right. Right. I might go nice. down okay. for. That's all right. He's going to make yeah, it down. Yeah. All right, guys. If you enjoyed this episode, send it to a friend, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to Construct Your Life with Austin Lenny. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and pay it forward by sharing with a friend. Most importantly, take this opportunity to start constructing your life by taking immediate action on what you learned. For show notes, resources, and more information on one-on-one coaching with Austin, visit constructyourlifepodcast.com.